Hi, I'm Earl Butch Graves Jr., CEO of Black Enterprise. Welcome to our all new episode of From the Corner Office. We have witnessed the civil unrest sparked by the harrowing death of George Floyd while in the custody of Minneapolis police officers. The image of the knee of then police officer Derek Chavin on Floyd's neck as three other officers did nothing to stop this action resulted in protests across the globe condemning police misconduct and racial inequality. Currently, there have been outcries for police reform, including national legislation from Congress and proposals from local officials and community activists to restructure public safety and in some quarters, defund the police. Joining me to discuss the future of policing today are two outstanding law enforcement veterans. First, I'd like to introduce Durham, North Carolina Police Chief, Sarahlyn C.J. Davis, the first African-American woman to lead that department. Prior to assuming her current position in 2016, she spent 30 years of the Atlanta Police Department and ascended through the ranks to ultimately serve as the city's deputy chief. Due to her unassailable judgment and prowess, she was sworn in as president of the National Organization of Black Law Enforcement Executives, or NOBLE, in 2019. Her priorities, shaping a strategic agenda that focuses on criminal justice reform, community engagement initiatives, and gun control. My second guest is retired Chief of Police Rodney D. Monroe, an accomplished and highly respected expert in community policing and police reform. He has more than 38 years of experience in law enforcement, retiring as Assistant Chief of Police in Washington, D.C., and then continuing on to serve as the Chief of Police for 14 years in three cities, becoming the first African-American to lead departments in Macon, Georgia, Richmond, Virginia, and lastly, Charlotte, North Carolina. Due to his visionary leadership, those, six, those cities experienced historical reductions in crimes and significant improvement in police citizenship relationship, relationships through tech-driven, innovative programs and heightened community engagement. Chief Monroe continues his police reform efforts by partnering with an array of professional organizations and through his work as a federal monitor focused on recruitment, training, supervision, and accountability, among other areas. Chief Davis, Chief Monroe, thank you for joining me today. So uh, what I would love for you to do, uh, you know, I did a brief introduction, but I think it's important for everyone to know how you got into this in the first place. Uh, I want to say how you got into this, um, how you became a, uh, a uh, law enforcement officer, um, what inspired you to get you to, because ultimately you guys are, 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 bo are both now have ascended into being chief of police, but you didn't start off as a chief of police. Uh, and so what got you in, engaged in this, you know, 30 years ago, and th in Rodney's case, 38 years ago. So I'll start with you, Chief Davis. Tell us a little bit about your background and what got you into law enforcement in the beginning. Well, I think my childhood had a lot to do with uh, my journey. My father was uh, a career military man, and we spent uh, many years just, you know, traveling the world. And um, he was an advocate. He and my mother were advocates for uh, public service and volunteerism. And we were very active in the church and um, participated in a, a wide array of community types of um events on a regular basis. And I just had um, a love for um, law enforcement, um, the structure uh, of that kind of a work environment and didn't realize that, you know, even in my teens, I, I was very infatuated with investigative kinds of, you know, movies. And I watched all of, you know, everything from uh, Hill Street Blues to Hawaii Five-0, and as a young person, I was very influenced by investigations and assisting people to get through, you know, various types of uh, criminal activity. I, I uh, also served in the United States Air Force, and I think um, the short stint, you know, only uh, four years, uh, sort of was a, a good transition as I returned to the Atlanta area to join the Atlanta Police Department, and uh, that's where it all began. Great. Thank you, Chief Davis. Mm -hmm. Mr. Monroe? Well, you know, for me, it, it, it was a, a easy uh, journey. Uh, I, much like CJ, I've always been infatuated with law enforcement. Um, and, and, and just the, the ability to help people, to, 
to see things that are occurring uh, in your community and around uh, areas. Uh, that was, to me was a, a very exciting to be a part of something that was helping people, that you had the ability to help people. It, for me, it was never about, you know, the cops and robbers, you know, go out and catch the bad guy, but, you know, it, it started simply as really just wanting to help people. Great. Well, I thought we'd start as, as uh, I think it's important because, and I wanted to have the two of you on, and, I, and, I, and we're honored to be able to have both of you join us uh, this morning because the narrative that is surrounding uh, policing um, has been a challenge. Um, and obviously the events that what took place just a few weeks ago uh, in Minneapolis didn't help that. Now, this is not, the, it didn't start two weeks ago. This has been an ongoing issue as it relates to police brutality against people of color. And I thought it was really important to be able to bring on two black, two, two chiefs of police who are black law enforcement officers to talk about, one, to touch on a little bit about what we saw, right? Because uh, I've had the opportunity to speak with Chief Monroe a number of times about you know, how should something have been handled that we saw in the press? Um, and I've had the, 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 the uh, opportunity to hear how he would have done it. But what we saw there, um, the four officers who, three of whom who, who were watching or standing guard, if you will, and the one who actually um, had his knee on the neck of, of, of Mr. Floyd, uh, but I would love to get your point of view as to, because there's a lot of folks who've said, oh, why didn't those three other officers, those other younger officers step in, right? And, and push the officer off, or why didn't the citizens, which was suggested by one of the attorneys of them, why did the citizens jump in and push the officer off? So I would love to get your point of view to, to realistically, tell us a little bit about the chain of command, what happens at an arrest, what are the other law enforcement officers doing and what is their responsibility? So I guess I can um, start off, um, you know, as, as a human being watching what we saw play out on the public stage, you know, there, there was a myriad of emotions, you know, from my vantage point, um, anger, you know, hurt, disappointment in my profession. Um, and, and immediately just looking at that, that scene, you know, I identified, you know, at least three or four failures that, um, you know, I'm sure Chief Monroe uh, could also speak to that, you know, agencies around the country uh, sort of pick and choose what policies that they decide are appropriate for their departments. And I think as law enforcement professionals and as veterans, we saw that there was a failure to intervene. There was a failure to render aid. There was a failure to de-escalate. There, there was a failure on so many fronts in just that moment. And there was a failure to be a human being. And, and I think the last piece is the piece that really could have shifted the whole scenario. Even if we get trained, if we are not human beings in our work, then we don't need to wear the badge. So I'm not gonna take up too much because I'm sure Chief Monroe has his um, perspective of, of what he saw as well. And, uh, but those are some things that just really stand out for me. Yes, I, I think CJ is correct that there were multiple failures on, on so many different levels, but uh, no one can get past the human element of, of what uh, we observe. Uh, what was shown across the world was the actual execution of a man in the streets. And we've never really seen it the way that this played itself out. Normally we see it from a body cam perspective that doesn't show the officer and, and the, the expression or the human element associated with what uh, use of force they were engaged in. You saw this from the perspective of what that officer looked like, literally killing a person. 
And it was horrific because there was no humanity associated in that incident whatsoever. From that officer, the only person that showed any humanity whatsoever was George Floyd pleading for his life. That's it. So looking through that lens, right, because now the public was actually brought into the living room, right? Police, policing was brought into the living room of billions of people, if you will, across the globe, right? And so um, it was a stain. Uh, Chief Davis, you said it was, it was literally a stain on law enforcement. Yes. Because you had to look at this and say, I'm embarrassed for the way we conducted ourselves and did what, you know, and, and the way this was, was played out. But what, what should have happened right, in, that, in that environment? In other words, we're not sure of all the other, other elements, but when the person is pleading for their life, when they're saying, I can't breathe, when other law enforcement officers are saying, don't you think we should roll them over? I would like to know a little bit about the chain of command, because the understanding we have is that the other three officers were junior to um, uh, Officer Chauvin. Chauvin yes. right? yeah. So what, sh what can they do? When you say that they should intervene, what can, in a, in a chain of command, can, are they allowed to intervene to that this perspective? Uh, is this like the military where, no, the, the, the general is number one and then everyone is, has to, you know, the captain and then the privates and what have you. Is it that way or can they, as a law enforcement professional, wearing a badge, say, no, I'm stepping in regardless of my rank to say this is not humane? Absolutely. You know, um, we are sworn to protect our community, period. There's a, there's a hard period behind that. It doesn't matter uh, rank. When we see a violation, not just of a person's, um, you know, um, rights, a violation of their civil rights, this was an act of violence that played out in front of another officer and just as he would have treated that situation if that officer was a civilian who had his knee on the neck of another civilian, he should have taken the same steps to save the life of, uh, of George Floyd. So uh, there was uh, a violation of a duty to intervene. And when I talked about policies, you know, uh, most good agencies that are accredited have policies that require officers to intervene when they see that force is being applied inappropriately or excessively. But what, you know, what my perspective was of what occurred there was you had a person of, of higher rank and new officers who were very reluctant to, to step in and go against what that individual in charge was doing and not paying any attention to the fact that you had an individual on the ground that was, was literally losing his life. And the cavalier manner in which the, the whole incident played out was appalling. You know, the officer had his hands in his pocket. He was so disconnected from the, the trauma that was, was occurring on the ground and his attitude, his cavalier disconnected attitude was such a dichotomy. I, I, it's, it's unexplainable how there could be such a separation of emotions at that time. But I think what we witnessed, uh, again, was just a lack of humanity on, on, on all fronts of, of, of people not wanting to, to engage. And, and there's certain things that I don't think you can you can train uh, an officer to do or not do, and 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 what we seen in that video, uh, I don't know how you can train a person not to to be conscious of another human being's life and what you need to do to protect that. I, I like to kind of go back to you know you know the training of those officers, uh, even though they were all police officers of equal rank. Uh, you did have a senior officer uh, there with, with junior officers who are in a probationary period. 
And although they're all the same officer rank, that senior officer plays a role in determining whether or not those probationary officers remain on the force. So yes, they're going to be somewhat uh, aligned with that senior officer so that they're, they're not put in a position where they may uh, jeopardize their careers. But I also want to go back to, you know, when CJ uh, was in the Atlanta Police Department, I had an opportunity to witness some training that they, they put in place because they recognize that this happens. And it happens more often than we want to admit or that we really see where officers fail to intervene. I, I was able to observe a training class whereby they sent rookie officers, give, gave them a scenario, there's an officer in trouble and you need to go and help. And they would run down this hall and, and come into a room. When they entered that room, there was another police officer in that room just beating on a subject laying on the ground. And I probably observed about six or seven officers' response. And each one of them had a totally different response. And it ranged from an officer coming in that room and stopping that officer from beating that individual, all the way up to immediately coming in the room, pulling out their baton, and start beating the individual themselves without even knowing what the circumstances were. And it, it was truly amazing to see it, but they recognized that it happens and trying to, to, to teach officers and to train officers that you do have a duty to intervene when you see another officer exerting excessive force upon another individual. And I think that's something that, you know, we have to be mindful and not put our heads in the sand and don't believe that it doesn't happen probably more often than we would readily want to admit. Absolutely. You know, uh, Rodney, you had told me about before, and this is what's interesting is that this was not the first challenge that the Minneapolis uh, police um, had. Um, in fact, they've had some challenges for a period of time. Can you speak to, um, and I think it was back four or five years ago when they had a, a challenge before, and you actually um, were asked from a consultant standpoint to, to, to look in on that. Can you speak a little bit about what it was that was their challenge four or five years ago and how the fact that it was not corrected is probably what led to it being a problem today? Well, you know, what I was involved in uh, approximately five years ago was an after action uh, critical incident review based on a officer involved shooting in which, again, uh, another black man lost their lives at the hands of police. And, and I, we weren't responsible for looking into that incident. We were more so responsible for looking into the aftermath, similar to what you're seeing all across America, where there have been uh, protests, rioting, looting, things of that nature. So we kind of looked at how the Minneapolis Police Department uh, responded to that. You know, five years ago, under similar circumstances, you had individuals that actually took over a police precinct in Minneapolis and occupied it for 18 days. So we more or less reviewed that particular incident. But again, we've, we're seeing some of the same things that played itself out uh, six years ago today. And again, it only takes a spark for these things to ignite itself across the country. And this wasn't a spark. Someone threw a blowtorch into our community and set it on fire. No question. I would love to, uh, I want to move from George Floyd and, and want to talk a little bit about the challenge, because um, both of you are obviously are African American, and the challenge, given the narrative, given what has taken place, the distrust that exists within the Black community, which you no doubt hear, right? You, you all have been doing this for in excess of 30 years each. So you, you hear it from the community. What can be done? Because it's got to make your job, Chief Davis, you're still doing this. Your job's got to be doubly difficult, right? Because not only are you overseeing the, the entire police force, who and you happen to be an African-American, triply hard, you happen to be an African-American female who is overseeing the entire police force. And then you're hearing from the community saying, how can you be a police officer and continue to beat up on our people? 
and all the above. So would love to hear from each of you to get your point of view on how do you build that community trust, right? And both of you are focused on community policing so that you can get the African-American community to actually trust the law enforcement to, to, to look at you in the same humane way that, we, that we're being asked, <laughs> you know, that you were asking officers to look at us is to have people look at law enforcement officers as human beings as well. Well, for me, you know, I have to keep my feet on the ground about what is happening in front of me. I have to admit on a daily basis that this is what I do. It's not who I am. And, you know, I've said it over and over again. I get up in the morning and I don't wake up with this uniform on. And I've stayed connected to the community. I pay attention to the pulse of the community. And it's not the chiefs like myself and, and Chief Monroe who have built relationships and know how important it is to build those relationships because it's not really C.J. Davis that the community is mad about. They are mad about the system. They are mad about the thousands, the 18,000 police agencies that continue to have these incidents over and over again. And, and they're looking for someone to step forward and, and acknowledge, number one, that it is a problem. And it has been a problem for years. And it is a systemic problem. And it is, it's a call for, for leaders like us to not be silent, to uh, talk about what change looks like, and I think there are a lot of folks uh, in this industry that don't want the kind of change that we feel needs to happen. Um, there needs to be national standards so that police agencies outside of North Carolina, outside of Charlotte, outside of some of the places that have good community engagement programs are forced to comply with best standards. And until we get to a point where um, building relationships with our community and listening to our community and acknowledging the historical injustices that law enforcement has plagued on our community, we're not gonna be able to build trust with them. It's almost like being an alcoholic. You gotta admit that you have a problem before you can begin to heal uh, from that. You know, we, we do have a history and, and we can't run away from that history. You know, and, and being a, a, a African American chief in any city, and, and and especially when you come in as the first uh, African American chief, uh, you, you come in with an expectation from a multitude of different groups that are looking for something, and I think it it, it becomes more challenging because now you have to create a balance immediately. You can't sway one way or the other too far because if you go too far, then that other group will grab you in to their foes. So you have to look to maintain a, a, a real balanced approach and, and, and recognizing that there have been some injustices, willing to admit that there have been injustices. If you look in any police department and if you were to go through, particularly go through their disciplinary history of their officers, you will see everything in which society has ever done being done within law enforcement, whether it's cheating, stealing, robbing, killing, drugs, you name it, we've done it in law enforcement. And we have to be willing to admit that we've done it and that we're not perfect and that we've made mistakes over the years. So I think if you start from that basis and that foundation, and you couple that with your community to say that you have a legitimate role in how we police your communities. But it's not just based on you telling us what you want us to do. A part of that is your willingness to say and do what you need to do to help make your community safe and thereby being able to come together in a partnership and, and building a relationship. And yes, it's gonna be challenged, 
Yes, it's going to be broken, but there's more opportunities to bring the police and the community closer to closer together, whereby you're going to see real justice, whereby you're going to give people a voice to be heard. You're going to start to treat people fairly and with respect within their community. And you're going to hold each other accountable. What police are accountable for doing in protecting your community and what citizens should be accountable for in helping protect their communities. You know, you can't protect the person that, that comes in your community and shoots it up. You have to be able to say something. You know who that person is. You know that that's not the way that you want to live in fear within your community. So that partnership has to be built at the base level. All of us recognize that we have challenges. And when we have these type of incidents, it's going to rock that relationship. But I know CJ was able to get right back out there the next day, be out there in her community. They know who she is as a person and not just as the chief of police. And they'll have a willingness to continue to work with her and to continue to try to move all of us further along. To that end, I, I'd like to address recruitment because one of the, the, the biggest criticisms of law enforcement and, and, and police departments across the country is that the police department itself is not reflective of the community it, that it serves. Right? The, the, the numbers are not commensurate. If, if we represent 30% of the population, then why are we not 30% of the police department? Right. And certainly 30 percent of the senior officers within the department. Right. But it's it's society mirroring itself. So it, please understand this. The same thing happens in corporate America. Right. In the in the in the work that I'm in, you know, the the, the uh, even though our the, the customer may may account for 20 percent of the business of a corporation, it's never 20 percent of the employees are equal to what the, the, the market, you know, what the market that we represent, and certainly never at the senior level. But let's go back to, again, law enforcement. How can we recruit? Or what, it, one, outline what are the challenges in recruiting Black people to become law enforcement officers? What are those, um, uh, I'll call them institutional um, obstacles that may be in the way? Uh, bringing on more African American black law enforcement officers to police, um, and then beyond the obstacles, what's the solution towards trying to have more people who look like the two of you serve the communities that they serve? So it is commensurate. So you don't have a city that is thirty percent black and five percent of the police force is black. That that by definition lends itself to some challenges. Um, you know, to contribute to, to this part of the conversation, I would have to say that um, recruiting has to be intentional. Um, to, to say that you want a diverse department and you have a recruitment unit that's all white and, and, and in many situations sometimes um, that doesn't reflect females in the recruitment unit, you know, I always think in terms of if I were trying to get a job with Coca-Cola and the people who were trying to recruit me were all white males. And if I went to the website and all I saw was people that didn't look like me and even in the higher ranks, that would not be an agency or a company that I feel like I could fit into. So my position has always been you know, we shouldn't be raising a bar so high as to make people feel like it's a privilege to join us. It's a privilege for us to be able to identify people who want to serve in this day and age. So that whole, you, you, you can't join the club because your credit isn't good enough, or you didn't score high enough on the test, or you smoked marijuana when you were in high school, these are different uh, criteria that have eliminated potentially good applicants. When I, when I became a police officer, you know, back in the day, and I'm just going to say back in the day, <laughs> um, you know, we had some of our best officers that had high school diplomas, believe it or not. They were, and, and I'm 
I'm an advocate for education. I've always encouraged um, officers, even after they come on, you know, you need to go back to school. But some of the reasons that we have eliminated out, uh, people out of our processes have, have kept us from being able to grow departments that are reflective of the communities that we serve. And um, I think it's critically important, not just at the, at the um, entry level, but also throughout the ranks of a police department to ensure that everybody has an opportunity to uh, have a seat at the table at higher ranks if they're qualified for it. But I'm just one chief. Chief Monroe is just one chief. Does everybody around the country, 18,000 police agencies have that same ideology? I think not. Or we would see more folks that look like us in those departments if it were more intentional. You know, I think, you know, CJ is correct that it has to be intentional. Diversity just doesn't happen naturally. It has to be intention intentional. You know, I'd like to tell a story about uh, how intentional it has to be related to this story where we had a candidate, uh, a minority candidate uh, to apply to the department and he was rejected. He was rejected because he had uh, a couple of speeding tickets uh, associated on his record. So he was, he was, he was, but I said, well, let's look into this further. Let's see what, why he had these speeding tickets. He was a college student uh, going away to college, approximately 300 miles from home. But he came home every weekend. He drove home every weekend. Didn't fly home, was, couldn't afford to fly home, but drove home every weekend in order to help care for his younger siblings in his house so that his mother, single parent mother, could go to work. So with that, he had more opportunities to be stopped to received speeding tickets. And I felt that the fact that he was willing to come home every weekend to help take care of his younger sibling, to be more noble than any other officer that uh, was out there. And I overruled it and we hired him. And, and, and I think that if you don't have people willing to interject themselves in the process, and yes, you're gonna be uh, uh, labeled where well, you're lowering the standards. Yeah. No, we're not lowering the stand standards. That's the exact kind of person that you would want out there in the street who has a better understanding of the challenges that a lot of people in our communities face each and every day. And I'd much rather have that person dealing with some of those challenges than someone that has never had any challenges in their lives, has never been in difficult situations, that have never seen people have to struggle in life, in my department. So that's the type of person that you want to intentionally go out and try to recruit. Absolutely. I agree. <laughs> the, the, I guess the challenge is, is getting enough people who are sitting in the, in the seats that you two are sitting in that can say, well, let me examine this further, right? I mean, it's, it's this mirrors society at large. I don't care whether or not it's law enforcement, corporate America, medical profession, law profession, somebody there is evaluating who moves up next, who gets the next opportunity. And if the people who are evaluating who gets the next opportunity don't look like us, the likelihood of them bringing on someone who does, who looks like them, is higher. Right? And that has been across the board. So we shouldn't look at law enforcement suddenly as some, there's a different standard for law enforcement than there is in the law profession, right? Yeah. There, are, there, are, there are not enough black lawyers, enough, not enough black partners. Well, the people who are making decisions in terms of who becomes a partner in a law firm, if 95% of those people who are making the decision are white males, guess who's gonna become the next law partner, right? It's gonna fall back into that same exact thing. Uh, I'd like to switch the conversation, and I'm gonna be mindful of time, but I wanna switch the conversation to uh, more recently, and again, I'm trying to keep the politics out of this as best I can, right? Um, but there has been a lot of conversation more recently about, we need to defund the police. And I'm not sure everyone understands what defunding means because 
people are looking at defunding as like, oh, does that mean we get a chance to, to disregard and get rid of the entire police department and start over again, uh, which is not what it means. But it would be very helpful to have um, the two of you explain what do they mean by defunding the police and to the degree that that's not good, because when, to be clear, we're not going to eliminate police departments across the country, right? That is a insane idea, which, you know, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a, re it's a um, reaction mm -hmm. to what has in fact taken place and the violence has taken place. And under we can understand where that, where that anger may be coming from, but that's not a good idea, right? So please talk about, if you would, what does it mean to defund the police? Uh, what does it mean to eliminate a police department, right? And, and to, to move it out. And what would be the consequences of such an action? And why is it so important? Well, um, you know, you, you really hit it on the head when you said that the, the terminology has really been loosely applied in so many different uh, forms of what it actually means. And um, uh, to me, it seems to be more of a knee jerk reaction to, you know, uh, the anger and some of the emotion that has um, emanated uh, as a result of George Floyd's death. Um, you know, back when I first started as a police officer, police, police departments didn't have the level of responsibility that they do now. We have turned into social workers. We have we we deal with crisis intervention and train our officers now to deal with homelessness and uh, a myriad of other types of um, crises that our community members face. Uh, we administer drugs and Narcan now. Think you know uh, th those kinds of interventions that police departments you know didn't have to be associated with. So to me, what is happening is people are starting to see police is stepping over into areas that really, to tell you the truth, we never asked to be in that space in the first place. Our roles are to serve and to protect communities. And when we start talking about defunding or, or sort of reevaluating where funds should go, I think many chiefs agree that, yes, there should be other services to deal with homelessness. There should be other services to deal with mental illness. There were places that we could actually transport people to who had, you know, mental uh, problems or call somebody to come and get that individual and provide them the help that they need. Um, the same with, you know, domestic violence and all kinds of victim witness programs. A lot of the resources that, you know, have been moved out of our communities now rest in the laps of police officers, we have, and, and we do enjoy working with our young people. But even when the pandemic hit, Durham police officers were pushed in a space where they had to go help feed kids. And, and I'm not talking about for security. We literally had officers at the school system because so many young people depended on the schools, you know, for meals. So um, we, we have moved into spaces that I think have helped build relationships, but if we had that undergirded support that we so desperately need for our young people in our communities to help combat crime and prevent crime because poverty has taken over some of our communities and, and created a rich environment for, I do believe that we wouldn't have to have, I wouldn't have to ask for more officers. I wouldn't have to ask for people to, um, to assist with um, you know, all kinds of crisis intervention teams and these other um, activities that police departments traditionally have not had to um, be involved in. Police departments' budgets grow based on work. The more that you ask and, and, and draw upon police to do, the more resources they need in order to do that. And in order to reverse that, you have to show whereby if you deploy other resources to address some of these problems, the workload of police will drop. And if the workload, if you can, you can drop that workload, then you may not need as many officers out there doing things that you need. But, but now departments have 
cadres of people that are doing things that, again, as, 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 as Chief Davis mentioned, that we've never had to, to do before. You have entire units that, that are assigned to the courts, the district attorney's office, whereby, you know, I have to, to send officers out for, the, for the, the prosecutors to locate witnesses, to bring witnesses in. We, 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 we didn't start off doing, doing that type of work. So now you, you're creating additional work, so you're creating additional funding. I believe that sometime, some, at some point we have to create opportunities to be able to go out there and, 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 and fund, you know, parks and rec more than what we fund them so that rec centers can stay open later. So therefore, police don't have to deal with juveniles that may not have anything to do They get into uh, mischievous type of uh, 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 incidents, but if they had a place to go, we wouldn't have to deal with them in some other environment. So you create other opportunities for, for people where the police don't have to be the ones that respond. Even responding to, to passing out lunches, something bad can happen in that scenario where, you know, an officer that's, that's come from somewhere else that doesn't want to be there passing out lunches can say something or, or harm some, some relationship that we're trying to build with you. So why, why even put us in those positions where we can mess up when someone else better equipped can handle that, that function? Absolutely. I want to ask a question as it relates to uh, the prosecution of uh, police officers when things do go bad. And each of you have had to handle situations where, as, as, as chief of police, where you've had a rogue officer who's done some things that um, were, were an embarrassment or were not right, what have you. Um, in each of your cases, you guys handled it very quickly, turned it around, um, got it managed and and acknowledged the challenge. But I remember having some conversations with Chief Monroe when I was watching some of these other things of brutality and I saw Eric Garner here in New York effectively murdered in the same way, but you know, and held a certain way. And Philando Castile and 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 others that had had incidents. And I remember Chief Monroe saying to me, he said, I said, well, those guys are gonna definitely go to jail. And I remember you saying to me, don't be so sure, right? Don't be so sure, he said, because he gets in front of a jury and all a police officer has to say is, I felt my life was at, was at risk. I felt threatened in some way, shape or form. And sure enough, even though I thought there was no way possible <laughs> that they would get off, these police officers got off, uh, which then added to the distrust in the community. Now, everybody that's seen this video of, of George Floyd is saying, hey, there's no way possible. <laughs> it cannot be, there's no way possible. We've got nine minutes of videotape of a knee on a neck where they you know, effectively choked the air out of this man and he was killed, murdered. Uh, but I would love for you both to talk a little bit about how does it actually work? You know, beyond, now we're past the scene and it, it has to go through a whole series of, there has to be a charges brought, there has to be a prosecution, there has to be a jury selected, there has to be a number of different things. And when you put it back into that, when you start adding those other elements, that's when things go awry. Uh, but in, in, so it's a sort of a two part question. One is, how did you handle those things where it was painfully obvious that the officer or officers that you had who were working for you had done something very wrong and you knew it was wrong and you either got rid of them, fired them, got them charged and moved it on, uh, made a payment in, in, in some cases if it, it was, if it was appropriate and so that you could build back that trust and then Tell us a little bit, of, which may involve part, part of the conversation having to do with police unions. Now, I know you both are operating at a new, at a North Carolina, which is a right to work state, which is a little bit different. But we've got some police unions up here in the Northeast, which are very protective and 
are very effective, frankly, in finding ways to move the, 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 the conversation and to change the narrative in regards to what happens there. So I'd love for each of you to, to, uh, to uh, you know, share a little bit about your personal experience and then some as to what is the way, what happens once, once the charge has been done, once the, the, the act has taken place, what are the next steps and why are so many people finding themselves innocent of something that looks so obvious to us as being guilty or to the public, I should say. Well, um, I've had not just, um, I would say in the um, city of Durham, but you know, throughout my career in the city of Atlanta, there were numerous incidents where there were individuals in the police department who committed crimes. Everything from bank robbery to burglary and intent was not hard to prove at all. When a person puts on a mask, they go in a bank and they rob the bank. Or they go out at night with three other officers and they uh, enter a Home Depot, steal items out of the Home Depot store and sell them. Uh, those cases were not hard to um, you know, prove intent. So as a, as, a, as a police supervisor at that time, as a manager at that time, my focus was mainly on the administrative investigation and the policy violations were easy, very clear. You will obey the law uh, as, as a police officer. You will not violate your oath of office and so on. Of course, there were criminal charges that follow. In these situations of use of force, they're so difficult because intent is always the piece that is sort of the, the, the link or the weak link. And I'll let Chief Monroe talk a little bit more. He may have had uh, more cases of use of force as well, but you're absolutely right. It is, it's, you know, very disheartening when you see the crime that a person may have committed or what they are accused of, as in Eric Gardner, as in George Floyd, George Floyd died over a $20 counterfeit bill. Eric Gardner, cigarettes. When you think in terms of how egregious, you know, the act was and the ending of a human life because of, of, of that, uh, everybody wants justice. And um, it's, it's so difficult to um, see that play out as these cases are adjudicated. Um, Chief, you, you, you know, um, when you, Earl, when you mentioned about, you know, once, once you go into the courts and, and then it becomes a case of, of, of what was the level of fear that that officer experienced at that moment whereby they utilized deadly force. I think, you know, in, in, in the George Floyd case, you're, they're going to be able to show that this officer had no fear. There, there was no imminent threat immediately upon this officer when he took George Floyd's life. So I think that that case will move itself along much quicker. And, 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 but in these other cases, you have incidents whereby officers are able to say and, and per, per uh, project the level of fear that they had against you, this black person that was aggressive toward me. Then if you take that description and you put it into court in front of a jury of his peers, of her peers, you're going to have people that are going to be able to relate to that same level of fear that that officer may have described and therefore not be able to come to a conclusion of guilt because they're going to have some hesitation in trying to imagine what that fear was like. And many of them may have experienced it themselves 
whether it's, it's based on some of the things that we've seen where people have called the police simply because a black person was in their community and that gave them a level of fear that required them or caused them to call the police. So, you know, all of those things come into play once it gets into the courts. So now there's not necessarily people that have studied these issues, that have looked at these issues, that have examined these cases to pass judgment. It's everyday citizens that now are being asked to make a decision and it becomes a lot harder uh, once you get in that, that arena. But in this particular case, there's no way that they can show that there was any level of fear against or being directed toward them by Mr. Floyd. Thank you. You mentioned also about unions. Yeah. Uh, Yes, I think, you know, in the South, you know, there, there are right to work, uh, but there's still unions, and they're not unions, they're associations. Mm -hmm. the FOP is, is in, the, is in uh, Georgia and in North Carolina, and is the same as they're in New York or any other place. The only that difference- FOP stands for-, for Federal Order of Police. Federal, okay. Yeah. There are several other uh, organizations where officers are members, but the difference is that they don't have collective bargaining rights whereby they can bargain and negotiate for not only pay, but working conditions. Um, the unions still represent officers down, down, down here in, in disciplinary cases or criminal cases. Uh, you know, if you're an officer and you're involved in, in an incident, you'll have a lawyer uh, standing beside you uh, inside of an hour. Uh, I mean, they, 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 they are that well organized and focused to be able to bring, before they even speak to anybody else, they're always going to be right there by, by their side. So they're, they're still strong uh, in, in, in the South and right to work states, uh, but only they just don't have that collective bargaining. Uh, I'd like uh, my, my last questions uh, to you. Well, part of it was going to be a question. Part of it was going to ask you to to say something to share with the audience because this has been a this has been a very fruitful conversation. Uh, you all are showing a different, uh, a really really uh, wonderful view of law enforcement uh, and represent the best of who we are. Um, as law enforcement, who happen to be African American law enforcement, but uh, Chief Davis, if you could talk a little bit about Noble, right? You're the you're the, the head of Noble now. Um, explain to the general public and, and our audience what is Noble, uh, what's the focus of it going forward, and why it's so important. So Noble was founded back in 1976. Noble was actually established for these very reasons: racial equity and law enforcement, because many um, executives and officers who sought higher ranks in this industry had a very difficult time, you know, matriculating, you know, through police departments. So Noble was founded by 60 African-American executives. And the focus was to ensure racial equity, not just in police departments, but also to ensure the administration of justice in African-American communities because we witnessed, and if you think about that era and during that period, there were, there were still a lot of um, injustices in uh, communities of color. Uh, and while you know, we are 3,800 members strong, all of our members are not chiefs. We have associate members and then we have some members that are actually chiefs over major cities, you know, like um, Chief Monroe and you know, some of our other ones, um, you know, Dallas and Detroit. But out of 18,000 police agencies, Noble's voice is as strong as those chiefs that believe that there are problems that need to be resolved. And right now, Noble is on the forefront of this conversation because we believe this is a pivotal time in history. Everybody's paying attention. Everybody understands that when, when um, the protesters are crying for change, we are crying for change. And uh, you know, next week I, I will uh, 
present before the Senate in reference to national standards for police agencies, um, a misconduct registry for law enforcement agencies around the country so that officers can no longer jump from one you know, police agency to the next after they have you know, um, experienced some, some type of violation or disciplinary history. You shouldn't be able to go to another police agency and still wear a badge. Um, there are several elements in the, um, the legislation that's being proposed by Cory Booker and Kamala Harris and a couple of other senators. And that legislation has the principles and the tenets that we have um, presented to Congress as well to ensure that um, people get justice out on the streets of America that they deserve to be able to ride up and down the streets without being harassed. And I mentioned it earlier, and I'll be quick with this, but I mentioned it earlier about not waking up in the morning with you know, the uniform on. I've experienced injustices throughout my career. I experience injustices on a daily basis just going to a retail store. If I'm not in this uniform and I have on a warm-up suit and I'm, I'm shopping, I can have somebody following me around as if I plan to steal something out of a store, just like any other African American. So what we feel is our reality. It is true. It's a reality. And I am very happy at this point that people are actually having the conversation about it. And the conversation is involving people of, of, of all walks of life, a diverse group of individuals that are demanding change. So, um, you know, uh, I, I appreciate the opportunity to spend time with you, um, you know, Mr. Graves, and, you know, I honor uh, your efforts and your father's uh, legacy in this type of work, and we just appreciate the support that we're getting to get the message out that this is a noble profession, and we want to leave that legacy that we help to impact change. So thank you very much. Thank you, Chief Davis. Well said, well said. Chief Monroe, I'll, I'll leave it to you to, to, for some last words. Uh, what is it that you would like the public to know, right? Um, because I look at this from a, from a human standpoint. Um, black law enforcement officers are people, just like People that are that that sometimes get brutalized are people, and and we want to find the humanity in all of this. What words can you leave us with uh, towards bringing this back together, right? Where we can begin to appreciate and respect one another enough and understand the job that Black law enforcement officers have, understand the need for what we why we need law enforcement as a whole, and bringing this country together beyond and outside of the politics that we see right now, which is very disruptive um, and divisive as we're seeing right now. Um, what words can you leave us with today? Well, you know, I, I'm, I'm going I'm to direct mine more so back to uh, Chief Davis and what she and other um, Black law enforcement officers have have done and have continued to, to do to, to keep doing it. Um, you know, this this is not a what we're seeing is not a surprise to us. It's not something that we're fearful of. Uh, we we understand it. We probably understand it better than most of what's going on. And 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 the majority of of, of their work is going to continue on doing the same thing. She's going to still wake up the next morning and she's still going to reach out uh, to members of her community. She's still going to, 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 to be able to deploy officers to address whatever concerns or issues. So there's, there's not something that we're going to physically stop doing today based on what we see. What we're, we become frustrated with and where we want to put energy towards is others that don't recognize what's been happening, that doesn't understand how people are really feeling. We understand how people are feeling because we experience many of these things ourselves. And, and, and you know yourself, you've experienced it 
yourself, just being a black person going to work and the challenges that you've had. But we just want to be able to bring other people to an understanding that others need to play a role in addressing the issues. And, and, and is there systemic racism within uh, institutions and even within police departments? Yes. And being able to, to, to recognize that, acknowledge that, and be able to work through it. Not just that, that, that you know, even if you, you have a, a tinge of racism, it doesn't necessarily make you a bad person. But how do you get past that whereby whatever you may feel or harbor doesn't negatively affect someone else? Still allow that person to be able to move forward and do the things and garner the understandings that you need in order to help one another. Noble. They're not going to change their strategy. They haven't changed their strategy. They're going to keep being the voice. That's why when this things like this break out, you people gravitate toward Noble and say, help us. Help us to understand that we're here every day because we're here every day dealing with it. So keep doing what you're doing, CJ. Thank you so much, Rodney. Chief Davis, Chief Monroe, uh, on behalf of Black Enterprise, on behalf of, of African Americans, on behalf of this country, we thank you for your service. Uh, appreciate the work you're doing. Continue to lead, uh, lead us forward so that we can make this society for African Americans a more just place. God bless you both and take care. Thank you. Thank you. Be well. Thank you.